So in this video, uh, consider uh, a dam that it's shaped like a trapezoid, as you can see in the image provided. Um, the height of the, of the dam is going to be 20 meters tall, which you see right here. The width of the, of the dam, and well, it's dependent on where you are, it's 50 meters across the top uh, and it's 30 meters across the bottom. And we want to determine what is the force on the dam due to the hydrostatic pressure if the water level is four meters from the top of the dam. So the water uh, comes up here, it doesn't quite reach the top. There is this four meter gap right here. And so we're interested in how much force is being exerted against the dam based upon this the hydrostatic pressure here. So let, let's try to unravel this terminology a little bit. So when you see some, when you see this word hydrostatic, what does that mean? Hydro we probably are familiar with. Hydro comes from uh, the Greek, I believe, uh, which means water, right? Uh, and so although in hydrostatic problems, it, the fluid in play does not necessarily have to be water. Um, it is a very abundant fluid on Earth, if you've ever noticed. And so hence, these type of problems are named after water. Um, static, on the other hand, would be essentially the antonym to dynamic here. Static would suggest that things are not moving in play, right? We don't have like a river flowing into the dam. We just have a lake or a reservoir that's sitting there. There's no, there's no flow in play here. It's just sitting here. So why is there any force at all if things aren't moving? Well, uh, scientists like to model uh, fluid fluid dynamics, and, and in this case, fluid statics, uh, based upon the molecules that these, these water are, is made out of. You kind of think of it as like a bag of marbles, right? So imagine we have a bunch of marbles that are stacked on top of each other, making some type of like pyramid of marbles of some kind. So if we're supporting the marbles, like in our hand, uh, it, you'll, you'll have like this ball, this sphere of marbles, but if we were to place it on the table, what typically happens? Well, what happens is we, we see that the marbles will start moving to outward, right? Our tower starts collapsing and it spreads out. Why is it doing that? Um, why, what's causing these marbles to spread to the sides? Well, the basic idea is that the marbles on top, well, they're being pulled down by gravity. And when we place them on the table, the table itself is exerting a normal force back to them. Um, and so they can't just sink through the through the table, but because of the these these round marbles, your the marbles on top are kind of squishing the ones on bottom, and so that pushes them to to go outward, right? And so they spread out like so. And so this we've seen this if you've ever played with marbles or small balls before, uh, but it turns out on the the molecular level, uh, our these molecules are working at a very similar in a very similar way than this as the water molecules above are coming down they're being pulled by gravity they're actually pushing outward and so in in fluid dynamics when we have a molecule right because of its depth there's some pressure going on here so it's going to be crushing things below it but we also see that that pressure is going to be equal in all directions the pressure to the sides left and right is the same as the pressure going down um, and so what happens here is this dam is not a submerged uh, horizontal plate it's actually vertically standing and so you have water that's exerting a force on the side of this dam and we're interested in how strong is that force whoops how strong is that force all right and so it turns out we can actually use we can use uh, integration to help us calculate the hydrostatic force against this dam and so let's see how that's going to work so to begin with like with, with pretty much every uh, integration problem that we try to do we have to set up some type of coordinate system we have this dam in front of us but there's no there's no variables in play there's no x there's no y we have to define them so what we're going to do is we're going to place the origin of our geometry at the surface of the water and we're going to orient the x-axis in a downward direction uh, kind of like a downward dog pose right so we're going to place x equals zero right here at the top and we're going to orient uh the the positive x-axis downward like so and this is a little bit, this is just a matter of flavor, right? Where do you choose your, your X coordinates? Because it does make sense. There, there is a reason where you might take X actually to be the bottom of the dam. You could put X equals zero down here. You could get the bottom of the dam. That way X is actually measuring the water level. Uh, and you could calculate the hydrostatic force in that way. An alternative strategy actually could be to set 
x equals zero at the top of the dam and then go downward. Uh, advantages of doing this and the other approach is that these, are, these aren't gonna depend on the water level, which could change with the season, right? Um, and so, 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 so like an engineer who works at this, at this dam would probably set it up using one of those two things. Um, for us though, it's a little bit easier to set up these integrals if you take the, the surface here, because if you set x equals zero to be the surface of the water, then we're gonna see that x is actually equal to the depth, or I should say the depth is equal to x for this, right? How deep you go in the water is gonna depend on your x coordinate. So there's gonna be a simplicity of doing that here. All right, uh, let's see. And so with, the, with any specific depth, we can pick an arbitrary x value and look at a typical cross section, right? If we were to slice, if we were to slice along the x-axis a certain amount, we're going to have these little these little problems, little baby problems that we have to wor worry about, right? What's the force of this at this rectangle? What's the force of this rectangle? What's the force of this rectangle, etc. And so the idea behind this is we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume we're going to assume that uh, that basically all of the area is centralized. You know, essentially, I like to say we're going to assume that this is an easy problem. That's that's how I like to think of that. We're going to assume that all of this is sort of center centralized right here. All of the area is here. So what we've seen, what we saw before, is that the pressure, the pressure of a, a pressure of the hydrostatic pressure. That's the word I'm looking for. Is going to equal the density of the water times the acceleration due to gravity times the depth right here. And so by our assumption, but when I say easy, what I mean is assume all of the pressure is the same throughout. Assume um, uniform assume uniform pressure throughout this problem. So when you have a cross section, we're gonna assume that the entire pressure is the exact same. Even though there is some width to it, as these things are gonna be delta x thick, um, we, it, it's not a it's not a crude assumption to assume that it's the exact same uh, pressure throughout the whole thing. So our pressure in this case, because again we're working with the scientific units, we're going to get 1,000 kilograms per meters cube for water. Uh, acceleration due to gravity is 9.8, and then we're going to get x. So we get this 9,800 for the pressure. That's really nice. Uh, but force, remember. Force is pressure times area. So we have to also determine the area of the cross section. Now this is the part, like I said, this pressure is gonna be the exact same for every single problem. Um, basically for scientific problems, this is gonna be 9,800X um, or for, for British American units, it'll be 62.5X. Now the X of course could change. It depends on your coordinate system. But if you place x equals zero at the surface of the water, you're always going to get 9,800x right here. So that lack of variability is very comforting for students. The area problem, well, what's that going to be? Well, if you'll notice, our cross section is a rectangle. So its area is going to be length times width. The, the width of this guy is going to be dx right here. That's how thick it is. And so the length is really what's suspect here. And that is the part that this is basically the only part of our hydrostatic problem that we have to put really much mental strain in. How do we determine the, the width, the length of this thing? Excuse me, the length is going to be this part right here. Now, one thing we can recognize is that no matter where we are on the dam here, you're always going to have at least 30 meters to your length, right? So like this portion right here is going to be 30 meters. Uh, but then there's a portion right here, let's call it little a. And then by symmetry, you're going to get the same little a over here. So what we're going to observe is that the length is equal to 30 plus 2a. So if we can ascertain this a value, uh, we can get the length and then we, could, we can go from there. And again, our width is actually a dx. This is going to be the variable which we integrate with respect to. So we have to determine a, the, the variable a, as a function of x. And we're gonna do a similar triangle type argument here. So look at the following. We have the entire dam shape, uh, which is gonna have, it's 30, or it, it's uh, 20 meters tall, excuse me. And then on the top, it's 50 meters across the whole thing, but we lose 30 meters in the middle. And so there's 20 meters left for the sides, 
like so. And then my symmetry, we see that each side would be worth 10 right there. So you're gonna get this triangle, which is 20 by 10. And then if we look at a smaller version of this triangle right here, uh, you're gonna have this little triangle, which corresponds with our cross section. You have A right here. What is this value on the side? It's tempting to say that this value on the side is X, but that's not quite right. X is the, X is the distance from the surface of the water down uh, to the top of this little triangle. So the remaining portion would actually be, uh, we have to subtract this. And again, it's tempting to say 20 minus X, but notice X doesn't go from the entire top. It actually goes four meters down. Um, so actually the height of the water which is in this case 16, 20 minus four. That is what we're gonna take away. We're gonna take away from 16 X there. And so we get the other side of our triangle is gonna be 16 minus X. And so this is where the height of the water does come into play. So we can see here that if you compare the ratios, A over 16 X compares to 10 over 20, or if you reduce that fraction one half, uh, and so times both sides by 16 minus X, you're gonna get A equals one half 16 minus X. You could distribute the one half through if you want to, but remembering that we actually don't want A, we want two A. Um, if you plug that in there, you're gonna get that the length is equal to 30 plus 16 minus X. Therefore we get 46 minus X as the length of, of, of the rectangles. And so placing those in right here, we see that the, the area of each rectangle was gonna look like 46 minus X times DX. And so by putting these together, the hydrostatic force uh, of the water against this dam is gonna be pressure times area, in which case we see the pressure is 9,800 X times the area, is 46 minus x dx. Um, the last thing to determine are the bounds for x here. Where does x range? x can go anywhere from the top, which is x equals zero, all the way to the bottom, which is x equals 16. In which case, we then get from zero to 16 right here. So once this thing is set up, this is, this is of course the important part here. Once we get this thing set up, the actual calculation isn't so bad whatsoever. Um, let's actually take a look at what that would be. I would factor out the 9,800 in front, uh, distribute the X. So you're gonna get 46 X minus X squared DX, still going from zero to 16. By the power rule, uh, we're going to get uh, we're going to take X, we're going to raise it to X squared over two. Um, and then of course you can take half of 46 and get 23 there. 23 X squared minus X cubed over three as you go from zero to 16. When you plug in the zero, everything will vanish. When you plug in the 16, not so much. So you get 9,800 uh, times 23, multiply that by uh, 16 squared minus 16 cubed over three. Um, this is the point where I'm just gonna put this in a calculator to help me simplify this. Um, if you take 23 times 16 squared minus 16 th third um, over three, you're gonna end up with 13,568 all over three, times that by 9,800. Your exact answer would be 132966 four zero zero over three put in some commas there you get uh you know one hundred and thirty two million nine hundred sixty six thousand four hundred over three and but again we, we a rounded answer if we pay attention to significant digits that's that's sort of a big thing in most science classes i don't really care about that in a mathematics class but we're going to get that the force is going to be four point three so sorry four point four three times ten to the seventh newtons and we could upgrade this to like uh to kilo newtons or mega newtons if we wanted to but th this is our answer and be aware that the actual arithmetic and the calculus of integral is not really what's of interest here what is of interest is this integral right here why does this integral represent the hydrostatic force against the dam that's the aspect i'd want you to get through this video and feel free to re-watch this and revisit this if you have some struggles 
um, with this or post some comments in the in the or post a question in the comments below. Um, the point of these type of questions is to understand why does this interval give us the calculation? Uh, because it's a trivial use of calculation to actually find the answer. Why does that integral give it to us? And we'll see some more examples to help us with deepen our understanding of this. And so look for those videos now.